for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster, Monster Kid, Kid Radio. Radio. Here your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Monster Kid Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. Classic Monsters. Modern Talk. And the head of Rondo Hatton. Only on Monster Monster Kid Radio! Black Clock Audio Tales is brought to you by BunnySlippers.com and Found Item Clothing. Check them out at BunnySlippers.com and Found Item Clothing. Keep warm this winter, keep your feet warm, and uh, if you're over in the Southern Hemisphere, you can check out the cool t-shirts. Well, yeah, anyone can check out the cool t-shirts, but hey, it's summertime down there. And hey, this is Black Clock Audio Tales, hosted by me, D.B. Spitzer. Just got back from the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival the other day. Man, was it good. Listen for an upcoming episode about the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival from The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos, the other show that's on this podcast feed and hey check it out we're gonna have a new show coming up it's not gonna stay on this podcast feed but we're gonna feature it on this podcast feed at first it's called articulate warbling or that's not rave <laughs> that's not ranting that's articulate warbling with a uh, past guest uh, zach ferguson author and uh yeah so why don't you sit back and listen to one of the many stories we're about to tell you for the rest of this week uh month Actually, we've got a month of ghost stories, so, you know, if, if you like ghost stories you want to listen to them, why not go to pgttcm.podbean.com and donate. Become a member of one of our various uh, cults, or uh, fan cults. We've got the t-shirt cult, we've got the beer cult, we've got the advert cult, and then we've got the spectral cult. For people who just want their names and just want to donate a buck a month, I mean, hey, that's pretty cool. And you can always check us out at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Stitcher. I think we're on Spotify. Uh, We are on Instagram, and we are on Twitter, even though eh, I don't really use it. Thank you so much, and hey, go stories, rate, review, subscribe. Recording by Kurt Ziegler, Lake Placid, Florida. 30 Ghost Stories by Various Authors. STORY ONE THE FILLETED HAND BY GITA MAUPASSANT One evening about eight months ago I met with some college comrades at the lodgings of our friend Louis R. We drank punch and smoked, talked of literature and art, made jokes like any other company of young men. Suddenly the door flew open, and one who had been my friend since boyhood burst in like a hurricane. "'Guess where I come from?' he cried. "'I bet on the Maybill,' responded one. "'No,' said another. "'You're too gay. "'You come from borrowing money, "'from bearing a rich uncle, "'or from pawning your watch. "'You're getting sober,' cried a third. "'And as you sended the punch in Louis's room, "'you came up here to get drunk again.' "'You're all wrong,' he replied. "'I come from P in Normandy, "'where I have spent eight days, "'and whence I have brought one of my friends, "'a great criminal.' whom I ask permission to present to you. With these words he drew from his pocket a long, black hand, from which the skin had been stripped. It had been severed at the wrist. Its dry and shriveled shape, and the narrow, yellowed nails, still clinging to the fingers, made it frightful to look upon. The muscles, which showed that its first owner had been possessed of great strength, were bound in place by a strip of parchment-like skin. "'Just fancy,' said my friend. "'The other day they sold the effects of an old sorcerer, recently deceased, well known in all the country. "'Every Saturday night he used to go to witch gatherings on a broomstick. "'He practiced the white magic and the black, gave blue milk to the cows, "'and made them wear tails like that of the companion of St. Anthony. 
the old scoundrel always had a deep affection for this hand which he said was that of a celebrated criminal executed in seventeen thirty six for having thrown his lawful wife head first into a well for which i do not blame him and then hanging in the belfry the priest who had married him after this double exploit he went away and during his subsequent career which was brief but exciting he robbed twelve travellers smoked a score of monks in their monastery and made a seraglio of a convent but what are you going to do with this horror we cried a eh, parbleu i will make it the handle of my doorbell and frighten my creditors my friend said henry smith a big phlegmatic englishman i believe that this hand is only a kind of indian meat preserved by a new process i advise you to make bullion of it rail not messieurs said with the utmost sang freud a medical student who was three-quarters drunk but if you follow my advice pierre you'll give this piece of human debris christian burial for fear lest its owner should come to demand it then too this hand has acquired some bad habits for you know the proverb who has killed will kill and who has drank will drink replied the host as he poured out a big glass of punch for the student who emptied it at a draught and slid dead drunk under the table his sudden dropping out of the company was greeted with a burst of laughter and pierre raising his glass and saluting the hand cried i drink to the next visit of thy master then the conversation turned upon other subjects and shortly afterward each returned to his lodgings about two o'clock the next day i was passing pierre's door i entered and found him reading and smoking well how goes it said i very well he responded and your hand my hand did you not see it on the bell pole i put it there when i returned home last night but apropos of this what do you think some idiot doubtless to play a stupid joke on me came ringing at my door towards midnight i demanded who was there but as no one replied i went back to bed again and to sleep at this moment the door opened and the landlord a fat and extremely impertinent person entered without saluting us sir said he i pray you take away immediately that carrion which you have hung to your bell pole unless you do this i shall be compelled to ask you to leave sir responded pierre with much gravity you insult a hand which does not merit it you know that it belonged to a man of high breeding the landlord turned on his heel and made his exit without speaking pierre followed him detached the hand and affixed it to the bell cord hanging in his a clove that is better said he this hand like the brother all must die of the trappists will give my thoughts a serious turn every night before i sleep at the end of an hour i left him and returned to my own apartment i slept badly the following night and was nervous and agitated and several times awoke with a start once i imagined even that a man had broken into my room and i sprang up and searched the closets and under the bed towards six o'clock in the morning i was commencing to doze at last when a loud knocking at my door made me jump from my couch it was my friend pierre's servant half dressed pale and trembling ah oh, sir cried he sobbing my poor master someone has murdered him i dressed myself hastily and ran to pierre's lodgings the house was full of people disputing together and everything was in a commotion every one was talking at the same time recounting and commenting on the occurrence in all sorts of ways with great difficulty i reached the bedroom made myself known to those guarding the door and was permitted to enter four agents of police were standing in the middle of the apartment pencils in hand examining every detail conferring in low voices and writing from time to time in their notebooks two doctors were in consultation by the bed on which lay the unconscious form of pierre he was not dead but his face was fixed in an expression of the most awful terror his eyes were open their widest and the dilated pupils seemed to regard fixedly with unspeakable horror something unknown and frightful his hands were clenched 
I raised the quilt which covered his body from the chin downward, and saw on his neck, deeply sunk in the flesh, the marks of fingers. Some drops of blood spotted his shirt. At that moment one thing struck me. I chanced to notice that the shriveled hand was no longer attached to the bell cord. The doctors had doubtless removed it to avoid the comments of those entering the chamber where the wounded man lay, because the appearance of this hand was indeed frightful. I did not inquire what had become of it. I now clip from a newspaper of the next day the story of the crime with all the details that the police were able to procure. A frightful attempt was made yesterday on the life of young M. Pierre B. Student, who belongs to one of the best families in Normandy. He returned home about ten o'clock in the evening, and excused his valet, Bovin, from further attendance upon him, saying that he felt fatigued and was going to bed. Towards midnight, Bovin was suddenly awakened by the furious ringing of his master's bell. He was afraid and lighted a lamp and waited. The bell was silent about a minute, then rang again with such vehemence that the domestic, mad with fright, flew from his room to awaken the concierge, who ran to summon the police, and at the end of about fifteen minutes, two policemen forced open the door. A horrible sight met their eyes. Furniture was overturned, giving evidence of a fearful struggle between the victim and his assailant. In the middle of the room, upon his back, his body rigid, with livid face and frightfully dilated eyes, lay motionless young Pierre B., bearing upon his neck the deep imprints of five fingers. Dr. Bordian was called immediately, and his report says that the aggressor must have been possessed of prodigious strength, and have had an extraordinarily thin and sinewy hand because the fingers left in the flesh of the victims five holes like those from a pistol ball, and had penetrated until they almost met. There is no clue to the motive of the crime or to its perpetrator. The police are making a thorough investigation. The following appeared in the same newspaper next day. Monsieur Pierre B., the victim of the frightful assault of which we published an account yesterday, has regained consciousness after two hours of the most assiduous care by Dr. Bodillon. His life is not in danger, but it is strongly feared that he has lost his reason. No trace has been found of his assailant. My poor friend was indeed insane. For seven months I visited him daily at the hospital where we had placed him, but he did not recover the light of reason. In his delirium strange words escaped him, and, like all madmen, he had one fixed idea. He believed himself continually pursued by a spectre. One day they came for me in haste, saying he was worse, and when I arrived I found him dying. For two hours he remained very calm, then suddenly, rising from his bed in spite of our efforts, he cried, waving his arms as if a prey to the most awful terror, "'Take it away! Take it away!' It strangles me. Help! Help! Twice he made the circuit of the room, uttering horrible screams, then fell face downward, dead. As he was an orphan, I was charged to take the body to the little village of P. in Normandy, where his parents were buried. It was the place from which he had arrived the evening he found us drinking punch in Louis Sar's room, when he had presented us the filleted hand. His body was enclosed in a lead coffin, and four days afterwards I walked sadly beside the old curé, who had given him his first lessons, to the little cemetery where they dug his grave. It was a beautiful day, and sunshine from a cloudless sky flooded the earth. Birds sang from the blackberry bushes where many a time when we were children we had stolen to eat the fruit. Again I saw Pierre and myself creeping along behind the hedge and slipping through the gap that we knew so well, down at the end of the little plot where they buried the poor. Again we would return to the house with cheeks and lips black with the juice of the berries we had eaten. I looked at the bushes. They were covered with fruit. Mechanically I picked some and bore it to my mouth. The curé had opened up his breviary and was muttering his prayers in a low voice. 
i heard at the end of the walk the spades of the gravediggers who were opening the tomb suddenly they called out the curé closed his book and we went to see what they wished of us they had found a coffin in digging a stroke of the pickaxe had started the cover and we perceived within a skeleton of unusual stature laying on its back its hollow eyes seeming yet to menace and defy us i was troubled i know not why and almost afraid hold cried one of the men look there one of the rascal's hands has been severed at the wrist ah here it is and he picked up from beside the body a huge withered hand and held it out to us see cried the other laughing see how he glares at you as if he would spring at your throat to make you give back his hand go said the cure leave the dead in peace and close the coffin we will make poor pierre's grave elsewhere the next day all was finished and i returned to paris after having left fifty francs with the old cure for masses to be said for the repose of the soul of him whose sepulchre we had troubled end of story one the parlor car ghost all draped with blue denim the seaside cottage of my friend sarah pine she asked me to go there with her when she opened to have it set in order for the summer she confessed she felt a trifle nervous at the idea of entering it alone and i'm always ready for an excursion so much blue denim rather surprised me because blue is not complimentary to sarah's complexion she always wears some shade of red by preference she perceived my wonder she is very near-sighted and therefore sees everything by some sort of sixth sense you do not like my portieres and curtains and table covers she said neither do i but i did it to accommodate and now he rests well in his grave i hope whose grave for pity's sake mr j billington prices and who is he he doesn't sound interesting then i will tell you about him said sarah taking a seat directly in front of one of those curtains last autumn i was leaving this place for new york traveling on the fast express train known as the flying yankee of course i thought of the flying dutchman and wagner's musical setting of the uncanny legend and how different things are in these days of steam etc then i looked out of the window at the landscape the horizon that seemed to wheel in a great curve as the train sped on every now and then i had an impression at the tail of the eye that a man was sitting in a chair three or four numbers in front of me on the opposite side of the car each time that i saw this shape i looked at the chair and ascertained that it was unoccupied but it was an odd trick of vision i raised my lorgnette and the chair showed emptier than before there was nobody in it certainly but the more i knew that it was vacant the more plainly i saw the man always with the corner of my eye it made me nervous when passengers entered the car i dreaded lest they might take that seat what would happen if they should a bag was put in the chair that made me uncomfortable the bag was removed at the next station then a baby was placed in the seat it began to laugh as though someone had gently tickled it there was something odd about that chair thirteen was its number when i looked away from it the impression was strong upon me that some person sitting there was watching me really it would not do to humor such fancies so i touched the electric button asked the porter to bring me a table and taking from my bag a pack of cards proceeded to divert myself with a game of patience i was puzzling where to put a seven of spades where can it go i murmured to myself a voice behind me prompted play the four of diamonds on the five and you can do it i started the only occupants of the car besides me were a bridal couple a mother with three little children and a typical preacher of one of the straightest sex who had spoken play up the four madam repeated this voice i looked fearfully over my shoulder at first i saw a bluish cloud like cigar smoke but inodorous then the vision cleared and i saw a young man whom i knew by a subtle intuition to be the occupant 
seen and not seen, of chair number thirteen. Evidently he was a traveling salesman, and a ghost. Of course, a drummer's ghost sounds ridiculous. They're so extremely alive. Or else you would expect a dead drummer to be particularly dead and not walk. This was a most commonplace-looking ghost, cordial, pushing, businesslike. At the same time, his face had an expression of utter despair and horror, which made him still more preposterous. Of course it is not nice to let a stranger speak to one, even on so impersonal a topic as a four of diamonds. But a ghost, there can't be any rule of etiquette about talking with a ghost. My dear, it was dreadful. That forward creature showed me how to play all the cards, and then begged me to lay them out again, in order that he might give me some clever points. I was too much amazed and disturbed to speak. I could only place the cards at his suggestion. This I did so as not to appear to be listening to the empty air, and be supposed to be a crazy woman. Presently the ghost spoke again and told me his story. Madam, he said, I have been riding back and forth on this car ever since February 22, 1890. Seven months and eleven days. All this time I have not exchanged a word with anyone. For a drummer, it's pretty hard, you may believe. You know the story of the Flying Dutchman? Well, that is very nearly my case. A curse is upon me and will not be removed until some kind soul. But I'm getting ahead of my text. That day there were four of us, traveling for different houses. One of the boys was in wool, one in baking powder, one in boots and shoes, and myself in cotton goods. We met on the road, took seats together, and fell into talking shop. Those fellows told big lies about their sales, Washington's birthday though it was. The baking powder man raised the amount of the bills of goods which he had sold better than a whole can of his stuff could have done. I admitted the straight truth, that I had not yet been able to make a sale. And then I swore, not in a light-minded, chipper style of verbal trimmings, but a great, round, heaven-defying oath that I would sell a case of blue denim on that trip if it took me forever. We became dry with talk, and when the train stopped at Rivermouth, we went out to have some beer. It is good there, you know, pardon me. I forgot I was speaking to a lady. Well, we had to run to get aboard. I missed my footing, fell under the wheels, and the next thing I knew they were holding an inquest over my remains, while I, disemboweled, was sitting in the corner of the undertaker's table, wondering which of the coroner's jury was likely to want a case of blue denims. Then I remembered my wicked oath, and understood that I was a soul doomed to wander until I could succeed in selling that bill of goods. I spoke once or twice, offering the denims under value, but nobody noticed me. Verdict, accidental death, negligence of deceased, railroad corporation not to blame. Deceased got out for beer at his own risk. The other drummers took charge of the remains and wrote a beautiful letter to my relatives about my social qualities and my impressive conversation. I wish it had been less impressive at that time. I might have lied about my sales, or I might have said that I hoped for better luck. But after that oath there was nothing for it. Back and forth, back and forth on this road, in chair number thirteen, to all eternity. Nobody suspects my presence. They sit on my knees. I'm playing in luck when it is a nice baby as it was this afternoon. They pile wraps, bags, even railway literature on me. They play cards under my nose. And what duffers some of them are. You, madam, are the first person who has perceived me, and therefore I venture to speak to you, meaning no offense. I can see that you are sorry for me. Now, if you recall the story of the Flying Dutchman, he was saved by the charity of a good woman. In fact, Santa married him. Now, I'm not asking anything of that size. I see that you wear a wedding ring, and no doubt you make some man's happiness. I wasn't a marrying man myself, and naturally I'm not a marrying ghost. And that has nothing to do with the matter anyway. 
but if you could i don't suppose you would have any use for them but if you were disposed to do a good turn solid christian charity i should be everlastingly grateful and you may have that case of denim at seventy two dollars and fifty cents and that quality is quoted to-day at eighty dollars does it go madam the speech of the poor ghost was not very eloquent but his eyes had an intense eager glare which was terrible something pity fear i do not know what compelled me i decided to do without that white and gold evening cloak instead i gave seventy two dollars and fifty cents to the ghost and took from him a receipt for the sum signed j billington price then he smiled contentedly thanked me with emotion and returned to chair number thirteen several times on the journey although i did not perceive him again i felt dazed when the train arrived at new york and i with the other passengers dismounted it seemed to me that a strong hand passed under my elbow steadying me down the steps as i walked the length of the station my bag not heavy at any time appeared to become weightless i believe that the parlor car ghost walked beside me carrying the bag whose handle still remained in my other hand indeed once or twice i thought i felt the touch of cold fingers against mine since then i have no reason to suppose that the poor ghost is not at rest i hope he is but i never expected nor wished for the blue denims the next day however a dray belonging to a great wholesale house backed up to our door and delivered a case of denims with a receipted bill for the same what was i to do i could not go about selling blue denims i could not give them away without exciting comment so i furnished the cottage with them and you know the effect on my complexion pity me dear and credit me frivolous woman as i am with having saved a soul at the expense of my own vanity my story is told what do you think about it end of story two ghost of buckstown inn by arnold m anderson several travel-worn drummers sat in the lobby exchanging yarns it was rodney green's turn and he looked wise and began his tale i don't claim by any means that the belief in ghosts is a general thing in arkansas but i do say that i had an experience out there a few years ago it was late in the fall and i happened to be in the village of buckstown which desecrates a very limited portion of the state the town is as small and dirty a place as i ever saw and the buckstown inn was not much above the general character of the place the region is inhabited by natives who still cling to all sorts of foolish superstitions the inn in the antebellum days was kept by one who was said to be the meanest and most crabbed of mortals the old demon was as miserly as he was mean and all his narrow life he hoarded his filthy lucre with fiendish greed report had it also that he had even murdered his patrons in their beds for their money what the facts actually were i don't know but even so to this day the old inn is held in suspicion a lingering effect of former horror still clouds its memory the present proprietor bunk watson his real name is bunker i believe is an altogether different sort of chap a southern style in fact one of those shiftless heatless happy-go-lucky mortals who love strong whiskey and who chews an enormous quid of black tobacco and smokes a corn-cob pipe at the same time when the former keeper shuffled off his property fell to a distant relative the present keeper who with his family immediately moved in from a neighboring hamlet and took possession it was well known that the old proprietor had accumulated considerable wealth during his sojourn among the living but all efforts to discover any treasure upon the premises had failed and now the idea of ever finding it was practically given up as far as bunk was concerned the matter troubled him little he had a hard-working wife who ran things the best she could under the circumstances and saw that his meals were forthcoming at their respective intervals what more could he wish 
Why should he care if there was a treasure buried upon his place? Indeed, it would have been a sore puzzle for him to know what to do with a fortune unless perhaps his wife came to his aid. Among the stories that hovered in the history of the Buckstown Inn was one which involved a ghost. In the room where the former keeper had died, peculiar noises were heard at unearthly hours, sighing, moaning, and, in fact, all the other indications which point to the existence of ghosts were said to be present. On account of this, the chamber had long since been abandoned. I listened with keen interest to the wonderful tales about the haunted rooms, and then suddenly resolved to investigate, to sleep in that chamber that very night and see for myself all that was to be seen. I told Buck of my purpose. He shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, but instead of warning me and offering a flood of protests, as I expected, he merely took his pipe from his mouth, let fly a quart or so of yellowish juice from between a pair of brown-stained lips, and, opening one corner of his white mouth, lazily called out, Jane. His wife appeared, and he intimated that I should settle the matter with the old woman. The prospect of a fee persuaded the wife, and off she went to arrange for my bed in that ill-fated room. At nine o'clock that evening I bid the family good night, took my candle, ascended the rickety stairs, and entered the chamber of horrors. The atmosphere was heavy, and had a peculiar odor that was not at all pleasing. However, I latched the door and was soon in bed. Having propped myself up with pillows, I was prepared to await the coming of the ghost. Overhead the dusty rafters, which once had experienced the sensation of being whitewashed, but were now a dirty, yellowish color were hung with a fantastic array of cobwebs. The flickering light of the candle reflected upon the walls and against the ceiling a pyramid of grotesque shapes, and with this effect being continually disturbed by the swaying cobwebs, the whole caused the room to appear rather ghostly after all, and especially so to an imaginative mind. I waited and waited for hours, it seemed, but still no ghost. Perhaps it was afraid of my candle light, so I blew it out. No sooner had I done this and settled back in bed again than a white hand appeared through the door, then a whole figure. At last the ghost had come, a white and sheeted ghost. It had come right through the door, although it was locked, and now advanced toward the bed. Raising its long white arm, it pointed a bony finger at me, and then commanded, Come with me. Thereupon it turned from the door, while instantly I jumped out of bed to follow. Some unseen power compelled me to obey. The door flew open, and the ghost led me down the stairs, through long halls into the cellar, through mysterious underground corridors, upstairs again, in and out rooms which I never dreamed were to be found in that old rambling inn. Finally, through a small door in the rear, we left the house. I was in my sleeping garments, but no matter— I had to follow. The white form, with a slow and measured tread, and as silent as death, led the way into the orchard. There, under a tree at the farther end, it pointed to the ground, and in the same ghostly tones before used said, Here you will find a great treasure buried. Then the ghost disappeared, and I saw it no more. I stood dazed and trembling. Upon recovering my wits, I started to dig, but the chill of the night air and the scantiness of my night robes made such labor impracticable. So I decided to leave some mark to identify the place and come round again at daybreak. I reached up and broke off a limb. Overcome with my night's exertions, I slept the next morning until a loud rapping on my door and a croaking voice warned me that it was noon. I had intended to leave Buckstown in that day, but prompted by curiosity and anxious to investigate, I unpacked my grip sack for a comfortable stay. You must understand that this was my first experience with a ghost, and I feared I might never see another. At breakfast my lady waited on me in silence, though once I detected her eyes following me with a peculiar expression. She wanted to ask me how I enjoyed the night, but I would not gratify her by volunteering a word. My host was more outspoken. "'Reckon you didn't get much sleep,' said he, with a queer smile. "'Did you hear anything?' I asked. 
"'Well, I did, yes,' he said with a drawl. "'But you didn't disturb me any. "'I knew you'd have trouble when you went into that room to sleep. "'That afternoon I slipped out to the tree. "'But to my amazement I found that the twig I had broken from the branches was gone. "'Finally I found under the lower trunk of an apple tree "'an open place from which a small branch had evidently been rested. "'But on looking further... I discovered that every apple tree in the orchard had been similarly disfigured. More mysterious than ever, I said, but tonight shall decide. That night I pleaded weariness, which no one seemed inclined to question, and sought my couch earlier. Going to try it again? asked my host. Yes, and I'll stay all winter, but what I'll get even with that ghost, I said. That night I kept the candle burning until midnight, when I blew it out. Instantly the room was flooded with a soft light, and at the foot of the bed stood my ghost, the identical ghost of last night. Again the bony finger beckoned, and a sepulchral voice whispered, Follow me. I sprang from the bed, but the figure darted ahead of me. It flew through the doorway and down the stairs, and I after it. At the foot of the stairs an unseen hand reached forward and caught my foot, and I fell sprawling headlong but in a second I was on my feet and pursuing the ghost. It had gained on me a few yards, but I was quicker, and just as we reached the outside door I nearly touched its robes. They sent a chill through my frame, and I nearly gave up the pursuit. As it passed through the doorway, it turned and gave me one look, and I caught the same malignant light in its eyes that I remembered from the night before. In the open orchard I felt sure I could catch it, but my ghost had no intention of allowing me any such opportunity. To my disgust, it darted backward and into the house, slamming the door in my face. In my frenzy of fear and chagrin, I threw myself against the oaken door with such force that its rusty old hinges yielded, and I landed in the big front room of the inn, just in time to see the white skirts of the ghost flit up the stairs. Upstairs I flew after it, and into an old chamber. There, huddled in a corner, I saw it. In the minute's delay it had secured a lighted candle, and as I entered, it advanced to daunt me with bony arm upraised to a great height. Caught, I cried, throwing my arms around the figure, and I made the acquaintance of a real live ghost. The white robes fell, and I saw revealed my hostess of Buckstown Inn. Next morning, when I threatened to call the police, she confessed to me that she had masqueraded as a ghost to draw visitors to the out-of-the-way old place, and that she found its tale of being haunted highly profitable to her. End of Story 3